Episode 8, Chapter 8, The King's Box of Tricks Chapter 8, The King's Box of Tricks It was a grey, dreary, outright miserable day in the volcanic crags of the Koopa Kingdom, and King Bowser's heavy footfalls echoed down through the smoggy valleys like thunder as he led his troops toward home. Noxious smoke drifted lazily across the landscape in blankets as thick and white as snow, hiding fuming fissures and sheer chasms which plunged away into an unseen underworld, rumbling and seething with fiery intent. Hot springs and lava pools lay shrouded amidst the fog, belching heat high up into the range of jagged, black basalt peaks which towered formidably overhead. The very air stank of fire, brimstone, and the death of the world. As Bowser crested the mountain pass to look out over the strangled expanse of lava and ash, he shut his eyes and grumbled out a deep sigh of relief. Finally, something in this screwed-up shell of a world was exactly as it should be. Just look at that awesome view, he said to himself, stomping to the edge of the great caldera and breathing in the sweet sulfuric stench of home. Down below, the mighty wasteland stretched for miles upon miles unassailable and free. Where's your empire now, Auntie Peach? Not here, that's where. So what if you've got the rest of the continent on lockdown, you'll never win a battle here on my home turf. It was true, too, if Kamek could be believed. As the old wizard had explained, the last surviving Koopas had fled into these very mountains after the Empress' genocidal purge, seeking shelter beyond the wall of burning stone. Here they had lived in secrecy for many years, hiding amongst the foggy ruins of their ancestral land. Kamek knew the way to these hidden settlements, or so he claimed, so he had been given the task of guiding the small army through the crags, in search of the king's scattered subjects. Technically, they were the long-lost prince's subjects, but Bowser insisted that it was basically the same thing. Everybody was a bit sketchy on the details, but if one version was dead, then the kingdom and its people should pass the other by default, right? Where did future self from a parallel timeline typically fall in the line of succession, anyway? That was something for the historians to puzzle out, Bowser decided. Eager to get a move on he stepped back from the overlook and turned to see what had become of his minions. As much as he enjoyed surveying his domain, he knew that there was more important business at hand. Returning to the trail, he trudged back the way he had come until the first of his elite soldiers began stumbling up into view. The Koopa patrols were just now cresting the ridge, marching in some sort of lopsided shape that might have been an organized formation six or seven hours ago. Behind them came the shy guys, tripping with every step, and the weary Magikoopas brought up the rear, wiping fog from their glasses and leaning on charred branches for support. A few still had working brooms, but many had elected to burn theirs during the frenzy of that short-sighted bonfire a few nights before. Normally, Bowser would yell something inspiring to snap them all back into order, but it had been a tough march for him, too. He and his minions had been on the move for over a week now, making their way slowly northward through this grimy mirror image of the Mushroom Kingdom that they knew. Everything here was just wrong, in a dirty and depressed sort of way. During the march, they had passed towns and homesteads that Bowser remembered from his invasions back home. There, the villages had been lively and cheerful but here they had become a series of slums and hovels that only grew more and more pathetic as the days passed. The villagers had treated them with a cautious wonder that bordered on awe. These chumps probably haven't seen a living Koopa in years, Bowser had thought at the time, watching the shabby toads as they turned out in droves to gawk at the little procession. Part of him had really wanted to light a cottage or two on fire, just to mess with the little guys but something told him that nobody else would have been laughing. Instead, they had carried on until the villages gave way to silent forests and empty marshland, cold and dead beneath the sunless sky. There they had found the winding trail that would lead them through the mountains to safety, and the haven that Kamek insisted was on the other side. 
Bowser hadn't even known about this trail. Had it always been there? Is this how the Mario Bros. kept slipping in? He'd have to put a gate up, or something. Now they were two days deep into the range, and the ground was finally starting to fall away again. As the weary troops reached the top of the climb, some of them evidently decided it was time for a break, collapsing right there on the trail in tired heaps. Bowser elected to give them a merciful moment, lumbering off to the side to catch his own breath beside the ravine. Kamek, where the heck are you? He called out in no particular direction, his voice bouncing off the walls of the nearby chasm. A couple of resting shy guys turned to glance his way, but otherwise he got no response. Losing his patience after a minute of waiting, he tried again. K-A-M-E-K, -E you old clod, get up here. That means right now. I'm just here, Lord Bowser. What is it you need of me? A voice piped up from somewhere very close by, and Bowser snarled wildly in surprise as he spun around in search of the source. Turning to check behind himself, he found the wizard standing on a nearby boulder tugging nervously at the hem of his tattered cloak. Kamek had developed the most annoying habit lately. He'd vanish for hours at a time, only to suddenly be right there whenever his name was called. Nobody knew where he went, not even Kami, but in any case it really didn't mean good things for his job performance. What kind of cruddy guide warps off for private time when there's guiding to be done? You have one job, you stooge. Bowser thought, briefly wondering if he should bother to chastise the errant mage. Whatever, all that matters is that he knows where we're going. How close are we, anyway? He asked, finally remembering why he had called the Magic Koopa back in the first place. The Koopa Kingdom was a massive realm and Bowser didn't feel like spending days wandering in the wilderness. We've been up here forever, and some of us have had to climb the whole way without cheating. You ever tried hiking with stumpy legs and a 300-pound shell stuck to your back? Let me tell you, it ain't easy. Oh oh. I understand, your heftiness. The Koopa settlement should be no more than three hours travel from here. Kamek replied hobbling over to the cliff edge and scanning the horizon. Bowser watched as he paused to shake some silvery dust off his hands and into the void, before turning back to elaborate. Keep going down this trail for a little while, then turn left at the overgrown bit with all the nipper plants. Ugh, three more hours? Why can't we just skip to the part where I get my army back? Bowser fumed inwardly, stomping a bit further down the trail to try and get a better view. Sure enough, there was nothing interesting on the horizon yet, but at least it was all downhill from here, and this dumb trek would be over by dinner. He thought of another question to ask, but by the time he had turned back, the wizard was already gone. There was nothing Bowser could do but glare at the empty spot where Kamek had been, and puff out a peeved little curl of smoke. Yeah, this is getting real annoying. Can't take the heat, Kamek. Then stay out of my way. With a growl and a hollow sigh, he started back uphill to see about rousing his followers for the final leg of their journey. Six hours later he found himself plodding across the Piedmont with a nipper plant gnawing on his tail. Okay, so I guess old people just have no sense of time in general, he thought, following the winding path through the ashen hills, occasionally pausing to try and shake loose the little weed. Or maybe it's a magic Koopa thing. I'll keep that in mind, the next time Kami shows up asking for the day off. This was seriously getting to be a chore. Bowser had led his troops down the mountain, right past the hungry thicket that Kamek had told him about. Several minions had come away with cuts and scrapes, 
and they'd lost at least one shy guy to the snapping vines that slithered beside the path. The plants hadn't eaten him, or anything gruesome like that. The little weirdo had just really liked the place and decided to stay. Now they were out in the emptiness, with nowhere else to go. Bowser was back in his own land, more or less, but this was clearly the crummy backwoods end of the realm. Where were the roads and towns? Where was the stuff? There had to be infrastructure somewhere out here, right? There was just no way he could really be the ruler of so much nothing. But the Black Badlands just seemed to stretch on forever and ever and ever. It was a hilly expanse of hot death, rimmed by the jagged, gnashing teeth of the distant basalt peaks. Here and there, sluggish rivers of lava cut glowing paths across the grey monotony, and the landscape was peppered with pyroclastic boulders of every shape and size. Bowser was just about to stop and summon Kamek again, because at this point it almost felt like pulling over to look at a map. But before he had the chance, he came around one last bend and nearly stumbled over his own two feet. One by one, his minions drew up short as they caught up to their king, and together the group looked out over a very unexpected new horizon. A hidden valley fell away before them a forgotten veil that sloped gently down amongst rippling hills, eventually settling into a low field tucked snugly beneath the overhanging cliffs. Wisps of pale steam danced into the air from a thousand hidden hot springs, isolating the tranquil valley behind an almost dreamlike mist. In the far distance, squatting in the shadow of the protective mountains, lay the toppled ruins of an ancient castle. The old stone keep might have been a proud sight, once upon a time but the passage of years had left it pitiful, its bastions blown apart, its outer ramparts sinking sadly into the lava moat, sagging like a sand castle in the tide. There was something oddly nostalgic about the site, the lonely ruins and the enfolding valley that cradled them, but Bowser just couldn't seem to place it within his memories. He didn't have to wonder for long, because soon Kami came floating up beside him with teary eyes. I should have guessed the survivors would gather here, of all places, she said, climbing gingerly off her broom to stand at the edge of the hill. Bowser just shrugged at her, so she squinted up at him and tried to explain. Don't you remember where we are, my lord? This is your nursery. It's where you were hatched. Bowser grunted in mild surprise, glancing back out over the fields at the forlorn structure. It had the royal aesthetic for sure, but it was so much tinier than the other grand keeps that he had grown up in. If you say so, Granny. I guess it does look pretty twerp-sized, for a castle. What happened to it, anyway? Kami's face scrunched in concentration, the memories evidently not coming easily. Let's see, is this the one that the Yoshis wrecked? No, that one was on an island, wasn't it? I still can't get my noggin around that tail, you know. How do a few lizards and a baby take down a guarded fortress? The old hag grumbled incoherently for a few moments, before throwing up her claws in resignation. Eh, whatever. I can't remember what happened to this place. It's probably Kamek's fault, though. It usually is. Did I hear somebody say my name? The wizard asked as he sidled up to join them, appearing yet again from literally nowhere. Catching sight of the valley, he gasped and gave Bowser a proud pat on the shell. Oh, it looks like you've made it. Excellent work, my king. He looked like he had more to say, but instead he leaned back to inspect the nipper plant that was still gumming on Bowser's tail. Wordlessly. Kamek pulled a wand from his robe and prodded the pale weed a few times in the bulb. Within moments, the little plant had fallen off and begun to shrivel and blacken with a pitiful whine. As Bowser gladly shook the feeling back into his tail, Kami edged over to inspect the dead plant, now nothing more than a dry husk twitching in the dirt. Poor little fella, I kinda liked it. It was like having a team pet. It was a parasite, Kamek said impassively, 
tucking the wand away again. If you show kindness to a thing like that, it'll just keep getting bigger until it takes over your entire life. He started down the hill, beckoning for the others to follow. Anyway, the village is just ahead. I'll lead you the rest of the way myself, Lord Bowser. So they traveled deeper into the valley, following a trail that slowly became a road, past old ruins which turned one by one into quaint little homes. Water flowed from the nearby hot springs, trickling downhill through cooling stone channels which fed into streams and still ponds. Here and there, feeble attempts at farms and orchards twisted up from the blasted soil, leaves and branches clawing at the smoky sky. At the end of the path, in the shadow of the old castle, stood a small ring of shabby houses. They were lopsided constructions of piled stone and burnt timber, and Bowser guessed that they had likely been cobbled together from the keep's own debris. Smoke curled from chimneys and a few outdoor cook fires, and the Koopa King could smell the heavenly scent of grilled meat wafting from somewhere nearby. Yet, despite the smoke and the smells, there was nobody around. The little village was as silent and empty as a graveyard, and it remained so even as Bowser made his way, as loudly as he could, into the deserted town square. Yo, where is everybody? Get out here and praise me, you plebs. It's the return of the king. Nobody came rushing forward to praise him, but he thought he heard a shutter slam somewhere nearby. Then there was just more silence, and a group of minions up the street who were staring at him rather awkwardly. I swear, if Kamek led me all this way to some abandoned hick town, just to make a point or tell a sob story. Before he could finish forming the thought, Kamek himself waddled into the square to stand beside his king. The Magikoopa clambered up onto a charred stump by the fire, and then turned slowly on the spot to survey each lowly house in turn, squinting as if gazing through the walls at whomever might be hiding within. Eventually, he seemed to settle on one house in particular, slightly larger than the others, and Bowser guessed that maybe the missing Koopas had sardined themselves inside. Kamek hopped off the stump and went over to rap on the door with his wand. A few tense seconds later, the old door creaked open, and a nervous eye appeared in the darkness beyond. Kamek saw his opportunity, and he took it with zeal. Excuse me, sir. Do you have a moment to talk about? The door slammed shut, whacking Kamek in the beak and sending him stumbling back into the street. Bowser rolled his eyes. He had had enough of this game. He came to conquer, not to solicit. Wasting no time, he stomped irritably over to the house and yelled in through the flimsy wall. Listen up in there, chumps. I'm Bowser Koopa, the one true king. I've jumped across timelines, spent days in the wilderness, and been munched on by a bush. And I didn't come all this way just to be ignored by some cowards in a shack. There was no reply, but he could feel an uncertain presence just on the other side of the door. Get out here and face me like Koopas Troopas, or I'll huff, and I'll puff, and I'll light the place up. For a minute or two, only silence answered him, and Bowser paced back and forth as he felt the last of his goodwill melt away. Things were just about to get toasty when the door swung open again, and the skeptical, pinched face of an elderly paratroopa leaned out into the light. Prince Bowser died as a child, bless his bright young soul, the old turtle said, flapping up to look the king square in the eye. Behind him, a few more curious kuppas were peeking out around the doorframe. Why should I listen to you? You're big and loud, but that alone won't make you royalty. Those spikes on your shell could be paper cones and glue, for all I know. Bowser simply stared him down, unblinking and savage. The way I see it, I'm your king now no matter what my name is. I've got soldiers and magic, and you have, what, half of a farm? A couple of sticks and some mud? Yeah, this place is mine. He turned his gaze to the other Koopas in the doorway, 
and to a few who had appeared in the windows of nearby homes. But that means nothing to me, because I'm exactly who I claim to be. I'm Bowser Koopa, king of this land, and I'm the only one of me there is. That was the truth, too. His alternate self was dead, but that fact almost seemed extraneous. Any version of himself weak enough to get snuffed out, even as a puny kid, just wasn't worthy of the name Bowser. That name meant pure, awesome power, and nothing less. The crusty old paratroopa still wasn't swayed, but luckily the youngsters inside the house weren't nearly so stubborn. More and more faces appeared in the doorway. Some excited, some inquisitive, some even a little bit scared. And before long the Koopas were spilling into the street. Bowser gave his toothiest grin, backing up to accommodate the throng as the plaza filled with a rising tide of scales and shells. Shouted questions came at him from all sides. Where have you been hiding all this time? Asked a red-shelled teenager in the back. Why did you stay there for so long? We've been hopeless by ourselves. Yelled a wispy lucky two girl, perching her pink-tinted cloud on a rooftop. Eh, what's your name? Boyer? The guy with all the arrows? Wheezed an ancient green shell resting on a stump by the fire. This is gonna be easier than the time I took that baby's candy, Bowser thought as he eyed the frenzied group. Glancing back behind himself, he saw Kami and Kamek watching the scene unfold from up the street. Behind them stood his various loyal troops, several of them cheering or giving enthusiastic thumbs UPS. Yeah, thanks for the support, but don't forget your cue when the time comes. His minions had a vital part to play in this presentation too, after all. Where have I been all this time? He began, turning back to face the crowd. Well I'll tell you, folks. I haven't been hiding, or sitting around in some peasant shed like you guys. I've been in another world. He got some confused looks at that, so he decided to play up the clarification. Oh yeah, I mean that literally, a totally different reality. I've been gaining power, invading kingdoms and winning the hearts of fair pink princesses. Bowser Koopa. World Conqueror, that's what they call me. He glanced from one odd face to the next, scanning the crowd for a spark of loyalty. But now I'm here, cause it's time to take this world back. I mean, look at yourselves. He made a sweeping, non-specific gesture around at all the poverty. How long have you been hiding from Empress Auntie Peach? How many years since you left this valley, or ate a real feast? or polished your shells. When's the last time any of you sad sacks didn't totally suck? A ragged blue-shelled Koopa stepped up into view, one that Bowser thought looked very vaguely familiar. You're here for our help? But what can we even do? You said it yourself, we're not fit to fight against an army. There were soft murmurs of agreement all around. I don't need you to be strong like an army, Bowser grinned, leaning imposingly over the crowd, because I've already taken care of all that. Taking a step back, he gestured vaguely up the hill, a signal to his minions to bring forth the secret weapon, the thing that would win the villagers' loyalty once and for all. What if I told you, that each one of you could be way stronger than all the Empress lame goons put together? That certainly got the people talking. Hushed and frantic whispers passed back and forth, and a few more Koopas skittered out from the shadows to join the herd. Bowser's grin only widened as he watched the scene unfold, this was fun, but the best bit was yet to come. Two shy guys crested the hill, plumes of conjured smoke rising cinematically behind them. Between them, they carried an old wooden trunk the same chest that Bowser had hauled all the way from Toad Town back home. Inside was something very special, something magical, which these sad Koopas likely hadn't seen in a very long time. Until today, that is. Oh, man, this is gonna be so awesome. 
Bowser watched as his victory marched majestically forward. Then, a few steps before the cobblestones, one of the shy guys tripped and fell flat on his face, making the chest slip and fall to the ground with a dull clunk. The other one tried to pick up the slack, but the little guy just wasn't strong enough. He pushed on one corner, then the other, and in the end, the chest just sort of slid to a lopsided stop at the bottom of the hill. Dang it, you were supposed to look cool. Bowser roared in exasperation, glancing back and forth between the stunned shy guys and the baffled crowd. Shutting his eyes, he ran his claws through his fiery mane and took a deep, calming breath. Just pick it back up, Bowser. You can still pull this off. Keeping his steady gaze fixed on the peasants, he thudded over to the trunk and hauled it forward, positioning it in the center of his imagined stage. That other world I mentioned, it has something that this one doesn't. He spotted a young hatchling clinging to someone's leg, his tiny green shell still soft with youth. Hey, kid, come here for a sec. I've got something neat to show you. The young Koopa shyly stumbled forward, after a gentle nudge from his parent. The kid was probably only a few years old, that perfect age when hearts and minds are filled with wonder. Bowser leaned down and situated the wooden chest snugly between them. Tell me something, kid. Have your parents ever told you stories about... the stars? The little Koopa's eyes lit up like fireworks, and he nodded shakily with an almost stupefied reverence. But you've never seen them, have you? Bowser stood back up, roaring out his next and final questions for all to hear. How long has it been since any of you saw the stars in this cruddy world? How long since you've seen... these? With that, he upended the chest before the crowd, the contents spilling into the street like a glimmering golden waterfall of light. The items in the chest tumbled and bounced around the dazed child in brilliant waves, the kid shaking like a leaf and looking like he was barely able to process this. That same look of stunned disbelief was spreading to the Koopas in the crowd, and a few of them stuttered forward with tears in their eyes. Power stars! At least fifty or more! Skittered joyfully across the stones of the plaza. These were the artifacts taken from the toads back home. Bowser's true advantage in this new world of darkness. In the normal world, power stars were common enough to be used as batteries or even light bulbs, but here, Bowser guessed, they had all vanished along with the stars in the sky. Power stars are a byproduct of granted wishes, after all. Go ahead, kid, pick one up, the Koopa King said to the trembling child. It took a moment but eventually the kid reached out a tiny claw and grasped the nearest star by the tip. In an instant, the child's body exploded with a brilliant shower of golden sparkles and a pulsing aura of ever-shifting white light. As small as the kid was, Bowser could still feel the waves of pure and radiant power thrumming against his scales. You're totally invincible now. There's nothing in the world that can hurt you. Go on, try it out, do something stupid. In a power-charged frenzy, the kid immediately charged forward with a yell, smashing against Bowser's stomach with a mighty headbutt. The larger Koopa was immediately blasted back several yards, head spinning and body flailing as he instinctively curled into his shell. He wildly threw out a claw to ground himself, and eventually he pulled himself upright, only to find himself standing in a deep and chaotic trench that had been plowed down the street. Stomping back to the crowd, Bowser found them in an absolute uproar. This was it. Time for the finishing move that would make them all his minions forever. He wanted to hop up on a box or something, but he was never much for jumping. Instead, he settled for a low, flat boulder sitting by the roadside. The Koopas turned as one to listen, their eyes bright and their hearts open. Bowser saw the kid again beaming and sitting proudly on his parents' shoulders. Somewhere in the back, a group of teenagers started up a rhythmic chant. Power stars, power stars, power stars. 
Bowser threw his arms wide open and roared, letting himself get caught up in the spirit of theatrics. That's right, you downtrodden masses, you unwashed layabouts in your little stone shacks. I've got a pile of genuine, bona fide, energized, five-point power stars. Follow me, and they're all yours. Stick with me, and this whole dang world is yours. There was cheering, now, and the mania of wild celebration. I'll take you right to the top. Right to the source of all your trouble. And yes, you nerds, that's a capital T, which rhymes with P, and that stands for Peach. The Koopas surged ahead, embracing their new leader and the plan he hadn't even fully explained. Through it all, Bowser yelled and hollered above the deafening din. I'm talking about your gross empress. You want her gone? Well so do I. We'll march right to the gates of her fancy palace, we'll tear em down, and this whole wrecked world can witness the dawn of the brand new KOOPA empire. There was more cheering and applause, not just from the crowd around him, but from his original troops atop the hill. Bowser turned to wave at them, and he caught sight of Kami wiping a proud tear from her eye. Kamek was gone again, but what did that even matter? The little wizard had gotten them this far, and now Bowser was unstoppable. I'm coming for you, Peach, he thought to himself as the crowd swarmed around him in blind adoration. His brand new invincible army. For a moment, he let his thoughts turn darkly to the princess alternate self. The mysterious empress who had ruined so much. Yeah, you too. Auntie Peach. One way or another, I'm coming for you, as well. Very far away, in a secret base beneath the rogue port waterfront, the Ammonita resistance was trying in vain to plan its next move. I'm being totally serious, she called us. Toad insisted pacing back and forth beside the table with his stumpy arms in the air. We know where Princess Peach is, so let's go get her. What's the big deal, you guys? Gumbella just sighed, her loose hair falling limply over one eye. At that moment, she looked like she wanted nothing more than a hand to face Palm with. That's not good enough, little dude. Finding her was never the problem, getting to her was. She turned to stare at Luigi, who had been sitting beside Toad before the fungus had decided to start doing angry laps around the table. Besides, she didn't just call, did she, Green? You said the line went dead, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right, Luigi confirmed, shifting uncomfortably in his seat. It's like she just dropped the phone, or maybe somebody else took it and hung up. Toad shrieked something else about danger and rescue, but everyone else just groaned. This little argument had been raging for a while now, and Mario just wanted everybody to reach an agreement before he went nuts. His leg was healed, or near enough, and he was itching to get out of this basement and accomplish something. It was high time for the good guys make some headway, after all. Nearly everyone was present most of the group having situated themselves around the dining room table in a sort of makeshift war room setup. Bao was floating over by the sofa with her new besties. Pika and Lala, looking only half interested in the discussion. The only person missing altogether was Professor Frankly, who had hurried out of the room after getting an urgent email notification. Yoshi was the next to speak, flicking out his tongue to bop Toad in the head stopping the little mushroom in his tracks. If we tried to raid the palace, we'd get torn to shreds. You remember how well things went last time? He said, referring to the nightmarish escape from Peach's castle. If we want to get the princess back, and also not die, then we need a better plan. Well, we have to do something, Mario insisted, standing up and spreading his hands on the table. If we can't get into the palace yet, then why are we talking about it? There are other problems in the world, right? Tell me something that we can do. 
Mario waited patiently, but nobody seemed to have any ideas. Raz and Rainy whispered some things to each other, but then shook their heads. Vivian shifted nervously and adjusted her scarf, gliding further back from the conversation in general. Gumbella, meanwhile, muttered something indistinctly to Toadette, which caused the younger girl to burst out in a giggle fit. Truly, it seemed like they were getting nowhere fast. Old Wonky has some news, if you folks care to listen. The group turned to look at their little informant, who patted his stomach and glanced nervously around the table. Yes sir, some very interesting news indeed. This is pretty sketchy, you see, but Old Wonky hears that a traveling band of Koopas has been spotted up north. Villagers say they're making for the mountains. He rocked back on his heels and looked idly away, letting the issue hang. That might be worth an investigation, but that's just one guy's opinion. Koopa's on the move. Normally, Mario would know exactly what that meant, but this was a new and different world, and there was no Bowser around to cause trouble here. Before he could voice his confusion, Goombella shook her head and spoke again. That's unusual and all, but it's not really relevant to this plotline. Ah. So this version of Goombella had that little quirk, too. Mario's friend back home had always had a strangely narrative way of speaking, and sometimes he wondered about her grip on reality. He preferred to think that it was just her odd sense of humor. Now we're just back where we started, Luigi said glumly, starting to look very tired. Either he had been up all night reading again, or he was beginning to go stir-crazy like Mario was. Luigi was always the more patient brother, but Mario knew that even he had limits. Ah, not quite. I may have just the fix for this problem. A voice echoed from out in the hall. Moments later, a dried-out old Goomba scurried into the room, excited and slightly out of breath with age. Professor frankly made his way to the head of the table, his thick glasses fogged and slightly askew and hopped up on a stack of books he had prepared as a seat. Good news, everyone. I just received an email from my good friend Elvin. He's a scientist, like me, but he prefers a more hands-on approach to research. Some call him mad, but I call him a maverick. Anyway, I doubt you've ever heard of him. Mario and Luigi exchanged a pointed look both knowing exactly who the old Goomba was talking about. Professor Elvin Gadd had been a fixture during many of their adventures, for better or worse. Lady Bao evidently recognized the name, too, because she wasted no time injecting herself into the conversation. E. Gadd, is it? Why, of course I've heard of him. Who children tell the most frightening stories about him? Supposedly, he lurks in dark forests, waiting to capture innocent ghosts and harvest them for his sick experiments. She huffed and flew right up into the professor's face. Why ever would you associate yourself with a beast like that? Professor frankly blew out a puff of air, as if trying to disperse a vexing cloud of smoke. Bao held herself together, but backed off nonetheless with an offended glare. As she floated off, he turned back to the group and tried to explain. I met Elvin many years ago, when he was an accomplished inventor on the cusp of changing the world. If he settled into paranormal studies in his golden years, then that's entirely his business. Yeah, okay, but why did he email you? Gumbella asked, practically bouncing on the balls of her feet. Don't leave us hanging, old man. What's the sitch? Hmm? Ah, yes. In his email, Elvin sounded very frantic. Supposedly, one of his old inventions vanished overnight. I'll admit to skimming the babble paragraphs, but it seems like a machine which was very important to him. Mario listened intently, wondering which invention it could have been. F-L-U-D-D, or perhaps the Poltergust. Stars forbid if it was the time machine. He didn't even want to think about the kind of mess that would cause. Instead, 
he stayed silent and let the professor finish his tale. He claims that his surveillance system recorded several people sneaking into the lab last night, a cloaked figure, and six soldiers in grey iron armour. It's that guy! Toad shouted, suddenly springing into action again. You know, that one guy, who was there at the place. He stole the machine, and now Gab wants us to help him get it back. Isn't that right, Professor? The old Goomba looked bemused, but shook his head and sighed. Not specifically, no. Elvin was merely writing to inform me of the crisis. He never actually said that he wanted us to help him. But, um, we're going to anyway, right? Vivian offered, gliding her way back into the discussion. This might be a way to learn something new about what's been happening. I agree. It sounds like a fresh lead, and maybe some progress. Mario nodded, backing her up. One by one, the others all voiced their assent, and before long the conversation was alive once more with brand new theories and plans. Hold up a sec, said Rofe, who had been silent thus far. We own a truck, not a tour bus. There's, what, fifteen of us? No way are we all going on this little field trip. The conversation simmered back down, each person realizing that it was true. There's a choice to make here, unless y'all want me to find some straws to draw. And here I thought he was good at breaking silences, not starting them, Mario thought as he watched his friends silently eye each other, everybody wondering if they were possibly the best fit for this mission. In the end, Lala and Pika withdrew their names, as they had full-time jobs up in the city. Wonky was out, as his services were needed elsewhere. Professor Frankly was too old, and Raz and Rainey had very little adventuring experience between them. That helped to narrow the field, but not quite by enough. I should go, Luigi finally said, with no small amount of hesitation in his voice because I'm the only one here who's been to Gad's lab. He furrowed his brow and backpedaled a bit. Well, no. I've been to a version of his lab, in another timeline. But... But still, that's more than anyone else. What are you talking about? I've been there too. I was literally there when you met the guy. Toad bristled, waving his arms erratically. Luigi looked momentarily stumped, and then a flash of realization and shame flickered across his face. Mario remembered, at least. Toad had been there for that adventure, standing dutifully in the mansion's foyer all night. Toad, the poor little guy, just looked bummed. He slid back from the table and went to sit on the sofa with the ghosts. This always happens with you, man. You know what? I don't even want to go anymore, so there. It was Bao who spoke up next, materializing once more before the professor. In that case, I'd like to claim a spot in this party. I've spent a good portion of my unlife wondering about this gad fellow, and I'd very much like to meet him face to face. Luigi seemed to pale at the suggestion, and Mario wondered if that had been the mischievous Boo's intent all along. Mario supposed he'd better speak up now, if he wanted in on the adventure. After all, tickets seemed to be selling awfully fast. I should probably come along, if only to keep my bro out of trouble. Besides, I need my exercise, right? Everything else went unsaid. A and me. I'm going to. Vivian asserted almost breathlessly trying to get the professor's attention from across the table. I'm not. I'm not going to be left behind again. Mario smiled softly at her words, remembering the promise they had made earlier. Gumbella grinned, and then let out a sunny laugh. It's all the newbies who've volunteered. She exclaimed, turning to Raz and Rainey, and then to Rofe. Like, we can't just let them run off unsupervised they'd get smeared the second they left town. 
Mario wanted to contest that statement, but the Goomba girl had already made her case. I'm totally gonna go too, because somebody has to have experience. Nobody else came forward to volunteer. For a moment, Toadette looked like she wanted to speak up, but in the end she went over to sit beside Toad on the sofa. Yoshi, for his part, just shrugged and put his feet up on the table. Eh, five sounds like a decent number for a squad. Besides, I'm not so good with ghost houses. I'll chill here instead. It's settled, then. The professor cried, hopping up and down in excitement. The away team will be Marty, Valerie, Gumbriel, Boat, and... Luigi. Aha, I knew I'd get it right. Mario glanced at his little brother, so oft forgotten, and saw a single shining tear slip down his face. Welp, I hope you're happy, said Rolf, getting up to leave the area, because you five just made yourselves the main characters. Again with this strange story speak. Gumbella's weird jokes must have rubbed off on the old Dugan. After he left, several of the others got up to do the same, and before long, only the five of them were left. The new party resolved to leave the next day, and huddled together making plans throughout the evening and long into the night. As he prepared for a brand new adventure beside his friends, Mario felt his heart swell with an old, familiar warmth. There would be battles and hardships to come, yes, but for this one night, the future seemed as open and endless as the sky. End of chapter